Welcome to Bitcoin Fixes This, where we explore the impact that Bitcoin will have in all aspects of society. Today's guest is Laser Hoddle, programmer and pleb. He has been observing the last couple of years with a great deal of skepticism as fear has taken over. We talked about all sorts of things, including the Great Reset, the general compliance, and the spiritual dimension. Laser Hoddle, how's everything going, man? Jimmy, I really appreciate you having me, and I appreciate everything you do for the Bitcoin space and the Christian space, too. Well, thank you so much. And that is what we're going to talk about today, sort of like the monetary reset through the point of view of Christianity, I think is what you called it on your tweet a while back. I saw this back in September. I like messaged you right away. I was like, hey, like, let's do an episode about this. Of course, you were a little busy, so we've had to delay things a little bit. But yeah, I'm, I'm very excited. Can you just sort of tell my audience who you are and what your sort of basic thesis is? Yeah. So um, I'm a Bitcoin maximalist, a NIM on Twitter, a pleb. In my past life, I had a career in software I worked for. I built the front and back of big and small companies. I founded a few companies. And now I mostly opine and craft a thesis on monetary reset. Monetary mm. reset is the it's the phenomenon, uh, the exercise of the nation state rebooting itself at the end of a unsustainable debt cycle. Mm. Uh, and in our case, we're at the end of a large debt cycle or at the end of an empire cycle. We're actually going through a fourth turning. And um, if you zoom out even further, there's a 500 year mega political cycle that we're closing up to. And so the folks that defend the monopoly on money understand this and they mm. understand that it can, you know, chaos can be a ladder, can be advantageous. So, mm. you know, if you're already tearing everything down. You already are going to have to reboot the, you know, reset the game. Of course, it makes total sense that you would usher in next gen statecraft, that you would bring in the new primitives that you want society to abide by. And so, you know, one way to think of this is. The folks that defend the monopoly on money have known this is coming for decades, been sort of building up the narrative is going to be, and now mm. they're acting at the exact time that the system can no longer sustain itself. Mm. Well, so for those that are unfamiliar, can you describe these like sort of historical cycles that you're talking about? I think you mentioned the fourth turning. You also mentioned sort of like empire cycle. There's also like a 500 year cycle that you're talking about. Can you explain that just a little bit more so they have context on what you're talking about? Yeah. So, you know, the ebb of time is not static. There are mm. cycles and most people are familiar with the smaller ones, because you experience them. Most people are familiar with the small debt cycle. That's the cycle where, I mean, you'll hear politicians talk about this. It's basically, you have a boom and a bust cycle. Mm -hmm. you, know, you have a, a period of prosperity, then you have like a recession. There's a certain bubble might pop here or there. Maybe it's stocks, maybe it's housing. You know, you get your like your Occupy Wall Street, you know, because they're bailing out the constituencies that are not allowed to fail. People understand the small debt cycle, and that's mm -hmm. something like it's about every decade, give or take a couple of years. There's a larger cycle called the large debt cycle. Ray Dalio talks about this, the large debt cycle, and that's between 75 and 100 years. And in the large debt cycle, you typically have a reset, and the mm -hmm. resets take all sorts of different forms. But the simplest way to think about it is the balance sheet is no longer sustainable, uh, the balance sheet of your nation. And so they need to actually do some surgery to rectify that and restart it. And in the era that we're living through, the way to see that is, is debt, right? So can we afford to service the debt? Mm. Is, is the debt to GDP ratio sustainable in any sense? Meaning for all the money that we're printing, the idea is that it's creating growth that would make up for that. But if you don't see growth represented in GDP, it's a signal that you're at the end of what is possible with that model. And mm. so... Governments have to go in and, and manually rectify this. And so th that's reset. With the larger the reset, you know, when it's a big group of nations that are basically uh, hitting the end of the, their debt cycles at the same time, and that's what you see with the large debt cycle, you're more likely to get things like war, uh, these types of chaos. And you can argue, you know, 
is it accidental? Simply, you know, is, is it simply that the stability of nations falls apart? And so that's what leads to a natural conflict. But you could also look at it and say, war is a very good way to take people's mind off the fact that you're going to be using their family's life savings to bail out the world. Instead, you're replacing the rage or the wrath that they might, or the, the righteous anger they might feel about their family's time being stolen. You're replacing that with this kind of shared conflict and this shared narrative. And that's preferred from the state's point of view. They're both bad options, but this is a better one because they could point at that and say, well, uh, you know, it couldn't be helped. And I'm just glad we all made it through this challenging chapter of society. And so some folks look at World War One and Two and now, and, and they kind of lump them together. And they say that really, this was three large wars culminating in a great reset, a large reset of the entire West. Uh, so, so all the countries that make that up. And I think I'm closer to that. And I mean, you know, as far back to, to, to like the Romans, you know, the Caesars knew that, you know, you, you want to give the people gladiators and give them arenas and, you know, they need an outlet for despair, an outlet for sort of having their upward mobility sort of monopolized by the ruling class. And I think part of what we're seeing is, is, Modern war is really the evolution of that same model. It's statecraft. I don't believe that nation states are actually having genuine conflict within the West or even between West or East for that matter. I think that it's basically a way to give us gamesmanship, an outlet, and it creates a market for money. And it allows for reset. It allows you to reset the monopoly board, upgrade the state, upgrade the rules. And so... Just to be really clear about what I think is occurring is I believe that for the last several decades, well, let me put it this way. In 1971, Nixon took the United States off the gold standard and we entered the pure, you know, the fiat era. Money became notes. They could print it at will. I mean, everyone used that to transact in. That same year, Klaus Schwab started the World Economic Forum, which is a globalist steering club. <laughs> for the political wealthy and elite and central bankers and, and uh, you know, old money, this, this kind of thing. And, and there's many of these steering clubs, but the World Economic Forum is a key one because they're the ones that created the story of the Great Reset that we're living through. So in 1971, those two things happened, but that was also when China was added to the UN. And we saw Kissinger laying groundwork with Mao in China. And so I think... What happened is the elite, the wealthy elite, the monopoly on money realized where they wanted to take things, which is a consolidation of nation states. From their point of view, a nation state is just a line item on their balance sheet. It's, a, it's a, their portfolio countries, if that makes sense. Mm. Mm. And they can rule these countries through money, through incentives. Of course, nobody has absolute control. Right. They, you know, it, the world is a complex system. So they can't, in that conspiratorial way, they can't control, you know, everything. There's no magic. But, you know, wherever there is incentives, there's also coordination. Right. And when you have a power structure, that implies a hierarchy. At the top of the hierarchy is the ability to create money, it's the monopoly on money. And there's about 150 families who defend that monopoly and have for about at least 400 years. But you could argue that. You know, so 400 years ago was when the first central banks came on the scene and that science started really being perfected. But you could argue it's as long as 2,000 years, right? You can argue that all the way back into the Roman time. It's essentially the same, you know, the, the money changers, the you might say the Pharisees or, you know, the establishment of money was doing the same tricks in a more rudimentary fashion. It's uh, forms of usury, forms of money printing, forms of time theft advance it all the way to now and we're at the precipice of you know high tech usury in the form of like central bank digital currencies so you have these steering committees these ngos that came out in the 70s and from my vantage point it looks a lot like the central banking globalists went into china they raised up a modern china and they developed a the next generation of communism in if you look at China, like Beijing, it's this high-tech, dystopian, like a social scoring technocracy, okay? What I mean when I say that is, for the average person in China, 
it feels like a social scoring communism. Uh, culturally, you're doing it all for the collective. You're doing it all for country, the you know supreme leader, this this type of thing. And you're all playing by the same rules. By the same rules, you're being surveilled with omnipresent surveillance, so cameras, but also every single thing you do online. All those data is ran through social scoring algorithms, which are developed and maintained by engineers employed by the state. So, and the output of those social scoring algorithms determine your access, your privilege the level of persecution you experience in real life. Mm. And the way they do that is they assign it all to your digital ID, which is in China, it's it's an ID generated through inescapable biometrics. So things that you'll never be able to escape. And a funny antidote on this item is in the minority report, uh, Tom Cruise finds out that the oracles that they trust to predict a crime in order to persecute people, kill people, that they might be faulty. And so he had a moral quandary and he decides to listen to his own conscience and he goes underground. But because he's living in this dystopian social scoring technocracy, he actually has to remove his eyeballs in order to circumvent the digital identity gates that are everywhere. And so you can see why biometrics are really useful way to create an ID, you know, to, to, to tag the entire human race, because it's hard to escape from your own biometrics. And so that's what China does. Um, you can check out at the grocery store with your face. When you go online, you're logging in with government IDs so they can rate you based on everything you do. So you're profiled digitally with AI. That's all ran through social scoring algorithms, and that determines your lived experience. If you do really well, you're a model citizen. Um, you get lifted up, and they have billboards where they're celebrating model citizens. There, uh, you know, and that creates a feedback loop where, of course, that group of high compliance citizens really like the the system, so they're in favor of it. In China, if you don't comply, if you're not loyal to the, really, it's not even loyalty to the state anymore. It's loyalty to autonomous governance at this point. So, if you don't have loyalty to that system, you're driven down into the dirt. And it gets fairly bleak in terms of if you're like a repeat offender and you get low enough, you're, or you could say if your social score drifts down far enough, it goes so far as they might pick you up to re-educate you. You won't be able to use public transportation. You won't be able to get a job. If you keep going down, you know, they might disappear. You, um, mm -hmm. you know, in, in a way, you might zoom out and say, wow, those that room of programmers that the state employs in China, that's replacing all their written law. Because mm. in a world where you have to work online, everything requires the internet, and there's social, there's gates everywhere where you're using your movement passport to see if you're allowed to walk through gates, you know, to, to travel between town. In a world like that, the social score becomes your god, and the laws no longer matter. And as AI improves, they can basically it's really the ultimate power. And so you can see why theologically that's a problem. Now, it, China's been fairly benign with it, right? Like in general, it's kind of at the micro incentive stage, you know, in many games in the app store, you know, developers have figured out how to leverage psychology to get you to become addicted to the game, to get you to behave the way they want. And that's kind of where China is, is like, okay, if you don't, you know, you get a better score if you donate to charity, right? You get a better mm. score if you talk good about China. You get a better score if you're not on social media saying anything crazy. You know, the minute you go away from that, it gets worse. And so, of course, China has this, this image of red communism. And so when people say, oh, the Great Reset is about the West importing that Chinese system, that social scoring system, I don't think it would have that brand. I think it would have to be rebranded for the West. And so um, part of I, what I think is happening is that the central bankers raised China up. They developed this next-gen communism. It's ready. They have it working in Beijing. They're expanding it through China now. And I think that the idea is they, they want to import that into the West. And of course, in the West, we have a constitution, the standard of rights for individuals is much higher. Okay. So that mm. stands in the way 
of importing this system. And I think that alone will explain this entire decade. Hmm. Wow. So ton there. And uh, there's so many topics that you just covered in your rant there that I really want to cover. But let's start with this idea of this debt cycle being sort of extinguished by war. Can you talk a little bit more about this idea that war at this point is sort of like an outlet for frustration or something for those that are not in power or something like that? Yeah, I mean, so Look, if at the end of the debt cycle, you learned that your future was basically going to be used to bail out the broke nation state, it would lead to revolution and revolt. Mm -hmm. We would flip the table over. You know, mm -hmm. if, if you found out your parents are being sent to work and your grandparents can't barely afford food and your retirement's mm -hmm. being pushed out decades away and why? Oh, because the, the state's fiscally irresponsible at best and at worst, uh, it, they robbed you. So, you know, you would, that's not good for, <laughs> that's not mm -hmm. good for the folks in, in, in charge. And, and so there's an alternative, and that is to mire society in a global conflict. And, you know, pre-nuclear warheads, I think like a world war is pretty viable. Like the actual collateral damage is not that big. It's a, it's a very large saga. It gives people a constant fear and stress. It, it kind of puts them in a holding pattern. They huddle next to the state and wait for orders and wait, you know, wait for next steps. And that lets the state do the risky business of resetting the balance sheet, resetting society, and then they can relaunch society when it's over. And then they'll get another long cycle. And the long cycles are, they have seasons. So you have like a, a spring where you start getting a lot of growth. You have a summer where it's pretty, e you know, it's pretty easy going and predictable. Then you get into fall and winter as the debt cycle ends. And, you know, if you think, if you view central banking as like a business of harvesting human effort, then that makes mm. a lot of sense. In economic winter, they need a horror story that will keep everyone, that put everyone on pause so that they can stop the whole thing. Um, it's also a great time to hyperinflate, to basically take, uh, excavate as much capital as you possibly can. And then when you get through it, they want to cheer everyone on, give you hope again. So you build the next chapter of society. So it's like a harvest, you know, it's, it's almost like a farmer. You have times for harvest and times for <laughs> making it through the winter. But they have to give us that winter because the alternative would be us learning that the winter is actually money printing. Um, <laughs> Wow. Yeah. So let's relate that back to money. I think your argument basically is that war is a way to sort of like reset the monetary system, that there is something that you know, I, I guess the elites in the world want to happen in order to be able to get out from under this governmental debt or, you know, like reseed this harvest of human time and effort or something like that. Would that be accurate? Yeah. I mean, the way that it works is, you know, we've been convinced that money printing drives growth. But mm. in reality, money printing that usury, that time theft, actually, it needs constant growth in order to hide in. So mm. the harvesting of our time is not apparent. And during spring and summer and even fall of the long cycle, you don't really notice money printing. Like inflation genuinely is much lower than the growth of GDP. And so, you know, you see plenty of people winning around you. So it's easy to kind of look the other way. But in winter, when growth slows and people kind of batten down the hatches, the creature <laughs> becomes visible, right? You, you see the time theft. And so that's a huge predicament if you defend the monopoly on money and you need a big story. And to make matters even more complex, well, with nuclear proliferation, you can't really go back to that model. So that model is kind of the, the shelf life on like a hot war, a hot world war is kind of over. Mm -hmm. That point's been made apparent by, you know, you could see the, like a great military power like the U.S. is is kind of like chasing down the last low tech places on Earth to have war, right? Like like we're mm. wrapping up the Middle East and like that's but maybe you know the nuclear really does make it a no go zone as far and so there's not much left on the board for these for the military industrial complex. So the, you know that as a tool is kind of ending at least for you know for now there, there's not a good option there. And maybe you could argue that as we get into space, it'll change. It'll be a new frontier, but you know. It's also problematic if your agenda as a central bank is to consolidate 
your book of business, right? And you're you're running the same business in, in a bunch of different nation states, and you're putting in a lot of work to provide the illusion that they're separate. You know, it's mm. kind of like the Ethereum Foundation or, or the Federal <laughs> Reserve, right? Like it's a lot of work pretending it's a distributed node set when actually it's a monolith. But what, you know, funny enough, the thing that would prevent you from merging the West w- is actually war itself. Because if you don't have war, <laughs> you lose that tool for managing reset. It's mm. a catch-22 because not only is that game plan running dry because of nuclear proliferation, but it stands in the way of the agenda of globalist central banking, which is an agenda of globalization, of, of consolidation, of, of streamlining their nation state portfolio into fewer you know, statehood. That took me through a study of history and the way it relates in central banks and the way it relates to COVID is, you know, I started to wonder, is COVID actually a replacement for hot war? Is this mm. forever 24-7 deafening? hysteria loop, the weapon that is having the same effects as a world war would, we're sheltered in place, we're all in this together, we're we're huddled under the state waiting for what's next, we're all doom scrolling on our phones wondering when it's going to end. As they hyperinflate the currency and they're stealing our time, most of the population is saying, well, it can't be helped, we're in this shared global conflict. The debt cycle is turning over. The everything bubble, it can't stay unpopped for much longer. So they're going to get their reset of balance sheets. They're going to get their new monetary order. So, it, you know, if it walks like a duck and quacks like a duck, you just got to wonder, is this the modern replacement for war? That's when I actually became glued to COVID. And I started to mm. dig deeper because it was a, a fascinating idea. And the thing I realize is for that to be true, it would actually have to solve the problem of not being able to merge the nation states. And that's a big one because where hot war is a conflict between nation states, what could be devised that would allow all nation states to cooperate in war with something else? Mm. And that's when I started to uncover through my research, the thesis of Thomas Malthus. Thomas Malthus is a literary uh, thinker um, that was extremely popular in the globalist circles around the formation of the UN, around the formation of the World Economic Forum. And his main fear was that population would hit a tipping point. We would become too large a people on Earth that nature couldn't support us anymore. We would actually destroy nature because of our size. And this is really popular within global central banking circles, basically the elite of the elite on Earth. It's the idea that we're too large, our species is. They're terrified of that. And, and, you know, is it, does does it mean, are they scared that we're just spoiling the best parts of Earth, right? Just spoiling the gorgeous nature and spoiling the best parts of being just because we're this, this massive overgrown species. Ironically, because of money printing is probably... Uh, help to contribute to that. But, you know, is it that we genuinely are threatening nature? You know, I don't know. I, I have my suspicions. I think that nature is bigger than we can all imagine in terms of being able to support the ingenuity of man. So Malthus was extremely popular, and but you can't sell that to people directly. You have to package that in a way that they fight for it themselves. And I think what flowed from Malthus was environmental hysteria, racial hysteria, I think terrorism, the whole narrative on terrorism, I think COVID, I think, flowed from Malthus. I think these are all Malthusian fear spells that they actually all are shaped the same way. And so the COVID is bigger than any one country, right? No country mm-hmm. can solve it by itself. So we all have to eliminate previous norms. We have to join arms and we have to fight this thing together, right? Mm-hmm environmental uh, climate change. It's bigger than any one country. So we have to eliminate previous norms, stop competing. We have to start start cooperating so that we can fight this forever war together because we're going to stop the weather from changing or something. You know, terrorism, it was bigger than our own borders, right? So we needed to cooperate and, and form a security apparatus across the West together because of terrorism. So, so all of these things have the effect of culturally conditioning us to actually demand 
that trade-offs be made in order to bring the nation states tighter. And I think, you know, so that was over the last 75 years about that these things have slowly been laid and placed in front of us. And, you know, heading into 2020, that's essentially when that the everything bubble, the long debt cycle could no longer sustain itself. So I, I believe what's happened is China helped us, helped the West kick off mm. COVID with their propaganda of people keeling over on the floor. And, and they distributed that all over social media to get the fear loop started. And then the West took it over from there. And so mm. we've been driving this uh, COVID agenda for two years, completely disregarding natural immunity completely disregarding the fact that COVID's about as dangerous as the flu was, and now it's about as dangerous as the common cold. So it's, you know, not very dangerous. Completely disregarding a lot of common sense, and many can see it, all in the service of keeping this hysteria loop alive. Mm. So you have to ask mm. why. What, you know, no. <laughs> why, why is it two years later? Why aren't we wrapping, you know, why aren't we handing out NyQuil and calling it a day? Like, <laughs> what's going on? Mm-hmm. <laughs> and why does it look like they're absolutely insistent to push through this winter and on to next year? Why running with the script so heavily? And um, you don't have to guess, really. You can just look at the World Economic Forum. This is a, a steering club out of Davos with that same 150 families that, that defend the monopoly on money. And they tell you point blank. They say, the old way doesn't work anymore. We're going to clear all those norms. We're going to create a new world. And it's going to be one of social justice and one of cooperating together in order to fight these Malthusian wars on pandemics, on climate change, on racism, on cyber terrorism might be the next one. They've woven this very careful craft and a uh, story, and that's what we've been inundated with. And, and so you might say, laser, that's a lot. And I would say, well, you know, what would you expect to see if this was really happening? You would expect to see a handful of things that looked a lot like our the Chinese counterparts. Um, you would expect to see uh, movement passports, right? So yeah. uh, are we seeing movement passports being normalized? Well, certainly we are through COVID, through the vaccine passport. Okay. You would expect to see like a digital currency being floated. We're seeing that with CBDCs. So we're trailing China, but we're heading in the same direction there. Um, that would be in the same wallet as your movement passport. And you would expect to see internet passports as well. And so if you're paying attention to Davos, you, you would know that they've been laying a lot of ground for a cyber pandemic. Mm. So the idea that we're going to now have a pandemic on the internet, funny enough. And, <laughs> <laughs> and that would, you know, you could imagine that would just lead the same path, right? Cyber pandemic, internet lockdowns, internet passports. Mm. Okay. So now you're in a world where you have digital identity of your face that links to your central banking digital currency, your surf tokens, and you have a passport for moving around in your city, and you have one for using the internet. And that is the exact shape of the Chinese social scoring governance system. Um, but they're going to brand it in a Western way. They're going to brand it with social justice. Mm. It'll be the well, feel-good version. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's so interesting to me that you sort of like describe this whole thing, right? Like this idea of taking the entire population and bringing them through some form of propaganda and emotional manipulation as a spell, right? You call this specifically a spell that they're casting over the entire population. And, and you know, war is very much like that, but this pandemic is very much like that. And it's... And your charge is that this is essentially done by these steering committees like the World Economic Forum, and they are interested in preserving their wealth or like not letting their portfolio of governments go to zero, something like that. That seems to be the charge that you're making. That's right. That's going to be a little bit hard for a lot of people to swallow. I'm, I'm sure some pe- for some people, it's like very obvious. What's the... like? And I think you've presented a lot of that evidence, but why would they go to such lengths to do that? Because it it does cause quite a bit of suffering, you would think. Yeah. Well, I think they're trying to fight gravity. If you look at the, the, the 
the cycles have on it a pendulum. There's a pendulum of time that mm. oscillates between peak centralization and peak decentralization. You look at Rome, you had this broad empire that was centralized. Uh, you had few rulers that made very large decisions for most of society. And when Rome fell, the pendulum oscillated towards decentralization. And the central planners did everything they could to prevent it, but ironically contributed to their own demise through debasing the currency and getting to where the people wouldn't even enlist themselves as the Roman military. So they couldn't even call on any. They essentially eliminated their own monopoly on force in the end because they couldn't pay. Uh, no one would believe the pay. <laughs> mm -hmm. And so... You know, it's it's completely natural that those in charge would want to stay in charge. You don't want, you know, so it makes sense that you would fight a gravity, that you would try and prevent time from progressing. And, and it makes sense that you would do the same old plan that you've done for previous resets, just at the largest scale you've ever done it. And, you know, if your families and, and your friends have lorded over the monopoly on money for four centuries, you basically show up, you're a thinker, you show, you know, you're thinking about the top level narratives of society, and you show up to work every, you know, every long cycle, every reset, and you show up and you go, okay, here's how we're going to handle it. And here's what we'll do to mire everyone in conflict. And here, it'll be the narrative they get. And of course, we can't control everything, right? But we can, you know, with money, you can create a feedback loop, and you can kindle it and you can keep it blazing hot and you can steer that feedback loop and hopefully that gives you the effect you want whether it falls apart or not that they can't control that and i think we're seeing it fall apart right now but you can create the fear feedback loop from covid you can use the mainstream media to drive it you can use politicians to pair it build back better to signal that they're helping out with this agenda and if you're lucky it goes through and, and you're, you defeat gravity you stay in control you know you funnel everyone into the central banking digital currency system with this social scoring prison that really can't be escaped. And so, of course, that's what the states of the world have to do because the alternative, you know, you could steel man it. You could say from their point of view, they really think that that is a safer and better alternative to society than the unknown chaos of the alternative. Mm. Like, what is the alternative? Some emergent order that they can't control? right? You know, it's the lesser of two evils if you view yourself as a caretaker of the world. And, you know, you have to factor into this that the leadership of the world is very nervous that there's a large percentage of, of the world that they don't have the skills to compete in this era that we're heading into with AI and robotics and uh, machine learning and computer vision and and that um, that a lot of these jobs are going away. So there's a real genuine concern that the old capitalism doesn't work. It won't work. Mm -hmm. We need a type of modern <laughs> hybrid communism, fascism thing where the state partners with the industry. They have, there's an upper tier that engineers things, so they enjoy capitalism. But then everyone else who is arguably like useless feeders, we need an answer for them, right? And of course, the central planner's answer to that is going to be more central planning, right? Grow the powers of central planners to the degree that we've never seen before. That's their answer. And that's present in everything we're living through. It's normalizing movement passports. In the coming years, we'll see the launch of central banking digital currencies tied to your digital ID, which will probably be biometrics driven, and legal you know, government login to your favorite services on the internet, Twitter and Gmail and Google and, and this type of thing. So, you know, my charge is look at the empirical evidence, hold that in one hand, look at China, <laughs> look at the shape of their gov their statecraft, and ask if we're heading towards that. And, you know, at the same time, in the other hand, hold that feeling of something's not right about the last two years. There's something not right about what's going on. Um, it's not about a virus. And they can airdrop as many designer viruses as they want on the public to keep this going. But the fact is, viruses peter out pretty fast. They become endemic. They can be scary, but it's really hard to keep it ablaze for year after year. They're not going to be able to do that this whole decade. So they're either going to have to drop new designer viruses to keep that going, or they're going to have to pivot into something like a cyber pandemic where they cause an internet outage and you know, maybe it's only a day or two, but it's enough to get a new hysteria loop that they can 
engineer consent for a new, safer internet with restored trust and regulation by the government, right? So, you know, my charge is is large in the sense that I place at the feet of central planners a charge that they're fighting gravity, that they're trying to prevent a loss of power, a loss of control, and they've erected an elaborate type of new information warfare that replaces hot war that you know that is the charge all in an attempt to uh, reset the west and import china's social scoring technocracy form of government Hmm. well there's a lot there that especially with sort of the historical parallels I, i mean i think you were basically talking about the bread and circuses from rome that seemed to be happening here. There's this idea of, uh, you know, having a fear cycle that's continuous. And any, everyone that I've talked to that grew up in a communist sort of, or at least in the Eastern Bloc, like they all talk about how they were told constantly that we're about to get invaded. And that that was what sort of like drove them to work, basically. There's a lot of that that, that we've been talking about. And I like how you phrased it as a spell, right? Like how it's something that, you know, they cast over us as a way to control us or something like that. So my question here is, like, your perspective as a Christian, like, how do you ascribe all of this stuff? What's the thing that's actually happening underneath, I guess, the spiritual reality of it all? Yeah, well, it's long been studied and understood that you can traumatize crowds. You know, the the ABCs, they've understood how to traumatize individuals, and people get that. They understand that you can basically recruit someone through fear, through traumatization, and that's common-ish knowledge. But it's also known that you can do it to crowds. You can traumatize a crowd, and, and you can put them in a place of fight or flight, and then they will demand that the government take care of them, whoever runs the government. And that will eliminate any previous expectation of norms and even rights. And so, you know, you can scare a populist and you can get them to do what you want. In a way, it's like trauma is like a master key and a reset is like the door, right? Mm. And, you know, funny, Bitcoin is like, we can like change the locks with Bitcoin, right? You can say, <laughs> you know, no, no more of this. But from a Christian point of view, like, okay, so I've made a secular thesis there. I've said that mm. I've said that central banking families have been running the show a long time. They like that. They recruit politicians. They recruit average people with fear. They recruit politicians with money. They offer to corporatists basically a forever monopoly in this sort of new back, uh, fascist back end of the new social scoring technocracy. So you can recruit and list hordes of people to your cause without them actually knowing the deal, right? Through just regular Mm. incentives. And I think that's what we're seeing. And and that's the secular view. That's the secular view is like, we're going to go into the next version of their prescribed shape of society. Now, let's start folding in the Christian view here. So Mm. I don't think, you know, everything we observe and experience is downstream of creation. Mm. So none, none of it is out of scope of that. It's all part of it. And for me, I was actually an atheist before Bitcoin, before 2020. When I started buying Bitcoin, I was at the end of my tech career. And it, it basically started It started doing its work on me in terms of changing my worldview, realizing that I was you know, on the hamster wheel. I was chasing that exit like everyone is, trying to somehow find the get far enough ahead on the hamster wheel that when I hopped off, I would have enough time that I could retire or whatever. And I felt the nihilism of that. And when COVID started happening, I realized that we were just getting on a ride that was going to last about 10 years. And so I got deep into that. And, you know, I saw things that scared me deeply. I, you know, I saw basically, I saw that society can be recruited to cheer for like a genocide, to cheer for mass persecution of people. I mean, I saw in 2020 that it was going to head to this unvaccinated persecution that looked a lot like World War II with Mm -hmm. Nazi Germany or even uh, Soviet Russia with uh, the productive class. Um, And so that scared me because I realized something Jordan Peterson talks a lot, which is 
you think you wouldn't have been a Nazi, your family wouldn't have been a Nazi, right? You learn that actually the chances of that are not very good. It's far more likely that your family would have been recruited through various means without their full knowledge and ended up cheering for it, feeling great about it, wishing for the demise of, of the, the scapegoat. And that's more likely to be true. And that hit me like a, a million pa- pounds of sand because I realized um, the extent of evil that we can do as a species. Like I realized, wow, we're capable of that. And as a little punk, secular and programmer, I thought we invented religion as a way to place upon our species in a morality and ethic and that it had done its job, right? We had become moral. We had become good as a species. And now we don't need religion anymore. It was holding us back. That's, I actually thought that, Jimmy. <laughs> <laughs> and when COVID started happening and I realized that history was about to repeat and I realized the type of monsters that we could be if we didn't understand it, if we didn't do the work, it made me realize I didn't know what I was talking about. We all have in us the aptitude for sin, the aptitude for evil, and and I think you know it was so heavy that I wasn't sure if I could bear that, right? If I could bear where we were going, how dark things were going to get, if I could bear just the fact that you know the most the worst type of sin seems to be done through crowds that we could compound it mm. and turn it into these atrocities, a genocide and slavery and I think in that moment I, I felt despair and and I. You know, something made me remember my childhood. I grew up in a religious uh, a Christian family and, and um, a thought that, you know, like if I, I was going to end up back with Jesus and if I could do that, then I could bear it, right? I could bear this knowledge. I could bear the journey we were heading on together. I could bear reset and I could bear the transition out of the fiat era and more. And it just... That changed me. I mean, and so I can't just look at all this with a secular view. I can't. You know, fundamentally, I think these cycles are useful to Satan. I think that Satan works through uh, crowds. You know, I think that's, there's a huge return in compounding sin because everyone can casually go along with it, right? They don't have owner, full ownership, but it adds up to this monstrosity that that we can commit together. So, you know, I think a lot of what's going on is those with everything are taking advantage of the world have been. I think they're pushing through this arguably Luciferian agenda. Luciferian is it's man versus nature. So you have to defeat man to allow nature to thrive. And, and it's this idea that let's defeat God and create heaven on earth. Mm. And the culture of the central banking device seems to be Luciferian. Malthusianism seems to be Luciferianism. This idea that man is a, a disease, the virus, that we need to only allow a few curated groups. And I feel that with what we're going for. Because it is it really enough to just describe that like, oh, let's take over and let's let's scale back humanity so that, you know, we can enjoy more of the parts, the best parts of being. No, there's something else to it. I mean, there's an element of like transhumanism where it's like, oh, this vaccine is the beginning of this new mRNA industry that we're going to evolve the race through. So there's an element of like evolving into angels to kind of maybe embarrass God. There's an element of like creating a heaven on earth. And so I think there is a Christian story here. I think it's underlying it. and. What do you think about that, Jimmy? <laughs> <laughs> well, I find it fascinating. The thing that what you describe reminds me of it, as a Christian is, you know, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in, in the heavenly places. Like, that's what this whole cycle of stuff that you're describing reminds me of is, okay, it's not just these 150 families that are, you know, sort of like steering things from a monetary perspective and putting in the right incentives and stuff. It's almost like it's so well coordinated that I can't imagine, we both know how horribly inefficient government generally is when they're trying to do anything big. 
this seems a lot more coordinated, a lot, almost like uh, supernatural in its ability to sort of get people to fear. You know what I mean? Like, it does seem like it has a spiritual element. And that's what what you're saying seems to point to. And just to point out, like, you know, I thought your point was great that all of these things that people seem to be striving for, these are not new. They're ancient, right? Like men becoming angels or like, you know, bringing heaven onto earth or something like that. They're just sort of packaged differently this time. Something like that. It's also the whole, it's like an army of evil and many of them enlisted without their awareness. That strikes me, Mm. you know, it's so broad. It's not only has the West sort of formed to be in perfect unison, (laughs) right? Mm. All repeating the same points about Build Back Better and all these, these talking points from the Great Reset narrative. So not only is that happening, but just the pure amount of people enlisted, whether they're aware or not, like, sure, you can enlist people for money and gain in politics. Mm. That's straightforward, right? You're the monopoly on money. Okay. You know, you call up Larry Fink at BlackRock and you say, okay, here's what's happening, (laughs) right? Here's Mm. what's happening. And here's what the next 10 years are going to look like. And so do you want to be a part of that? Do you want to be a part of the next monetary, you know, a cycle? Do you want a forever monopoly? You know, that's easy to grasp, right? That all these businesses are being promised this favorable position would suddenly not really remember human rights anymore. It would suddenly be, you know, piling in to vaccine imperialism, piling into this idea of a social scoring web three. You know what I mean? Web three, what is that? <laughs> it's, it's, it's social scoring VR with government login. It, it's this idea that you're on lockdown, but it doesn't matter because we'll let you leave via the metaverse, but you're going to be <laughs> digitally persecuted or digitally profiled and persecuted in real life based on what you do online. Right. So mm. it's, it's, you know, that is one thing, but the idea, look how many people are fighting for it without knowing they're fighting for it. They've been recruited and it has to be by something bigger. It can't mm. in Nazi Germany, people, you know, the story that made concentration camps culturally acceptable was that, the Jews had this, there was an endemic of, I think it was typhoiditis. There was an endemic of, of some disease and all of society was grossed out. They were mad and grossed out and they were enlisted by the power, the collectivist powers that be to basically be, thank gosh, you know, for the safety of everyone, we need to do X. And there was a good deal of hate engineering and, and taking advantage of the worst parts of our species, the worst parts of, our, of who we are, right? That feels like where we're heading Right now, there's a lot of parallels there. So it's, you know, I caution people who kind of say, laser is this end of times in your mind. I'm like, I'm sure everyone who goes through, you go, you know, if you went through World War II, you might think, wow, this is shaped exactly like, you know, I hesitate to <laughs> try and make a call there. I mean, I, mm-hmm. I certainly see the, like, it rhymes with a lot of this foreboding of, it. you know, why is it so concerted? Why is it so concerted across the board? And that is, I've never seen anything like that, you know. It took like over a decade to build a a crappy little Obamacare portal, right? And suddenly they're going to roll in a social scoring technocracy. (laughs) That is weird. (laughs) And seems rather strange that I think your point about so many people being involved, it really like does sort of like show you like how something like Nazi Germany or Stalinist Russia can kind of happen. You put people under fear and then you give them some incentives. And, you know, in addition to that, there's some sort of like spiritual dimension where people sort of like let go of their morals or something. Like there's something really interesting about this whole politics of fear that like gets people to remove their inhibitions morally about certain things. And I think what you're saying is you're seeing that right now. It's, you know... We're I'm being denied it. a lot of rights. I'm seeing it, and it, it scared me to God. <laughs> <You> know, <laughs> uh, Jordan Peterson says, knowledge of pure evil will, will straighten you out. Hmm. And I think that's what he means. When, when you actually really understand that evil at scale, is it's not terrifying because it takes an evil person to do it. It's terrifying because regular people can be enlisted easily. That's the scary part about it. That's, it's terrifying because evil is easy. And that's the wake-up call. The wake-up call is like everything you do adds up. It compounds, and and that's the lesson of life. The lesson is look at the cost of sin. So don't make a victim of yourself. Build yourself 
up, become tough so that you have the courage and the ability to turn towards good, to turn towards God and don't squander it, right? And Mm -hmm. don't get enlisted by evil. Don't become taken advantage of. You know, if you were a family in Germany after World War I, they hyperinflated your currency. You had no savings. You had no Mm -hmm. future. You were a beaten down loser, right? Mm -hmm. So you were demoralized. And then some, you know, this idealistic orator from the military comes in and starts telling you a story of Germany's going to come back and starts creating a victim of you and giving you hope and and starts creating a shared enemy, something to blame, someone to blame for your, for your misfortune and brings the country together. And it's not a local problem. It's a problem that spans beyond borders. So Germany was united in their victimhood. That victimhood allowed them to be recruited to cheer for genocide, to cheer for camps, to cheer for a final solution. Because in their mind, they were oppressed and they were willing to do, you know, the pain became so intolerable that they were willing to do anything to break those chains. But you zoom out a little, didn't they commit this atrocity of group sin? In hindsight, weren't they fooled by Satan? Weren't they fooled by evil? And then ask, what's going on with the vaccines and the unvaccinated, right? When you actually look at the facts, natural immunity is superior. The vaccines don't stop you from getting or passing it. So it's just personal symptoms management. Why do we need the passports if the vaccines work? And if they don't work, why do we need the passports, right? So these people are being enlisted, cheering for quarantine camps, cheering for some solution because they are, at the root of it, resentful that they've complied so to this degree and there are people flaunting it that are not complying, right? And, and doesn't it rhyme? Doesn't it rhyme? And the bigger question is, you know, why is this occurring? Is it a complete accident or is following the money enough, right? Because if you follow the money in World War One and World War Two, it tells a story. It tells a story of international bankers who don't really want desire to lose hegemony over the power to create money, over the power to exert usury over the world. And I think we're just seeing the high-tech version of that, the info war version of that. And I think it's going to be a long decade. But at the same time, I think God's pulling these people towards him. He's waking, you know, you had this great awakening during like the Trump-Biden election. It was this big fiasco, but so many people felt red-pilled, like they're waking up, right? Oh my gosh, Mm -hmm. I'm finally awake. This is kind of a sham. It's a dramatization by the state. It gives us a sense of these two teams, but when it matters, they just install their guy that they need to be the cleanup crew of this this whole thing anyways. Mm -hmm. And then you have Bitcoin, right? Bitcoin's coming and people are taking the orange pill and realizing, oh, you know what? I can just defend my family's time and sacrifice. I don't have to play this game or contribute to this cyclical usury, this evil. You can opt out, right? And now people are being pushed to their limits with this vaccine imperialism, which is the instrument of central banking, colonialism, central banking, their effort to consolidate and, and upgrade, reboot the state. That's the instrument, the vaccine. And so, you know, in a funny way, all of this is serving to create a bunch of strong men that are ready to leave this soft era behind. Hmm. Hmm. Well, it's interesting because I think the thing that you're alluding to there is that there's like a monetary bankruptcy that we clearly have as a result of fiat money. But there's some sort of like spiritual bankruptcy that's coming as a result of that monetary bankruptcy, that this desire to sort of like put away all your morals and what you might believe in order to service the monetary debt that you're under. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think it's hollowed out. So, you you know, I think there was a whole era, an age of little progressive know-it-alls like me, like I was, who thought that we knew everything about science. We, as a people, we understood morality. We could, you know, we could leave God behind, so to speak, and we we're done with that. We had already become able, right? And, you know, even though what we're going through in um, starting 2020 and probably through 2030 is really a hardship, it, and it's a pain, it has all of us doom scrolling and watching and seeing what's going to happen. 
but it's also creating, it's, it's building people up. It's building strength. It's returning Christianity. It's, re- it's a return to the family unit. And the pendulum, you know, uh, they can't fight gravity. The pendulum is swinging back to its focal point of individualism. So there's mm-hmm. a phenomenon that's much bigger than reset and central banking and then even Bitcoin that's going on. It's returning people to God. It's returning people to their family. It's, re- you know, it's returning people to responsibility. And, you know, I, in a way, I think we should be extremely grateful that we get to live through this, that we get to build ourselves up to become tough, to become worthy of being, you know, I'm just grateful to be in this group of Bitcoiners, this group of Christians. And yeah, that's my feelings on it. Mm, wow. Yeah, it, it's interesting how the study of money and sort of learning about the monetary bankruptcy of the current world kind of leads you to recognize your own sort of spiritual bankruptcy, allowing us essentially to build ourselves back up, like you said, and becoming sort of the change that we want to be, we want to see in the world. So, I, so folks ask what I think happened after 2030, and I can dangle some ideas. I, <laughs> you know, if the purpose of COVID is to roll out movement passports and the purpose of a cyber, like an internet false flag, an internet pandemic would be to roll out internet passports all for, for a social scoring governance. I could see that taking the rest of this decade. You get mm. CBDCs, you get those two things. That's your basic building block to kick off an era of autonomous governance, right? High tech governance where it's less people, it's programs ruled by rulers, right? As opposed to, you know, it would replace law, right? So you wouldn't have a constitution, you wouldn't have law, and there'd be a de- de-emphasis on courts. It would Everything would be, become about the social score, because that becomes the god of the central planner and everyone who lives in the system. But, like, let's say they succeed. Let's say the Great Reset, like, they manage it, or there's enough takers, right, who don't opt out. I'm like, okay, just let me go back to my life, even if it takes a decade. Because if they can keep this going for two years, they can keep it going for ten, is the hard mm-hmm. truth. If my thesis is correct, that this is a consolidation of nation states in the book of business of central banks, then you would say, where does that lead? And if they solve the problem of being able to create conflict for reset, for debt cycles, without having nation states, you know, positioned as competing, you you get these Malthusian spells, then Mm. you you could extrapolate. You could say, well, does that mean we're going to head towards a new world order, like a single governance body in the whole world? And I think the answer is probably yes. I think that's what their aim is. Their aim is, let's have a bunch of different CBDC experiments, but we'll back them all by the SDR, the IMF's backing bucket. Let's have a an Eastern social scoring technocracy and a Western social scoring technocracy with different cultural branding, right? So you know, East versus West, but there's really just two supranations at that point. Mm. And I think, so then you might sit back and say, okay, how are you going to merge those? Because you get some big problems with merging those into one. And I think if cyber and COVID let us consolidate into a West and East, then the answer is probably something like, Jimmy, what is a emergency for the whole world big enough to warrant a strongly coordinating or even enjoined East and West? I don't know. Well, is is it a climate catastrophe that threatens Mm. the whole world? Is would Mm. that be enough to warrant dropping this competition and working together to save the world? And at Mm. at what cost to the those being ruled, right? And and I think you end up with a religious problem there Mm. because you know that's going to look a lot like end of times, right? When you have a Mm. one world order, so I think you're going to have huge problem with religious people and i think one thing that's been bothering me is i've been watching the abcs from canada and the u.s laying groundwork on this ufo stuff over 2020 i'm like why are they talking about ufos how does this (laughs) alien invasion yeah (laughs) how does this relate and i'm like are they planting seeds for something like a decade off from now and i'm starting to realize like why is the Pope following the Great Reset? Why is he saying build back better? And why is he saying not taking the vaccine is not, you know, the right thing from a religious point of view? Like, 
what's going on there? And part of me wonders if what they're aiming at is, is it preparing to merge the final two technocracies into a single social scoring government. And climate change is good enough for the, the secular world. It's a good enough mm. reason it would work, right? People would demand it. They, you, know, you know, let's say, for example, that weather technology for disrupting weather has improved considerably since the U.S. started using it in the Vietnam War to create muddy conditions for the enemy. You know, I know China's used it to China's used it to divert storms for the Olympics, and then Japan also luckily diverted a storm for their Olympics. Um, and so, you know, like any tech, like how much has it improved over the last half a century? You know, can they do hurricanes? Can they do earthquakes? Like, what can they do? So. Part of me wonders with climate change, like you need a big scare event that you can get a new hysteric loop going that would mm -hmm. cause people to be in the same uh, state we're in right now, where we're hunched over, terrified, wondering what's going to happen. So part of me wonders if, you know, they create a weather event and even if it's relatively mild, it's the type we haven't seen before and that can create a multi-year hysteria loop. You have the problem with the religious people and I wonder if there's a fake alien something where that brings an era of ecumenism, uh, ecumen uh, what's the word, ecumenism, where it's basically like, let's all be friends, all the religions need to join. And so that's what I got. I'm, I'm looking far out. The main thing is I'm wondering, why is climate not being, why is that not the head of the spear right now? It's COVID and cyber. So that's for something later. And then why this stuff with the UFOs? It's kooky, it's weird. And the only thing I could think is that you start asking the question, what would prevent you from merging nation states until you ended up with one? One AI-based government that the rules would just be a small group of programmers at that point, right? So then the, mm. the percentage, you know, the one hundredth of a percent of the population can just instruct a small development house to say, okay, here's the virtual law, right? And in that world, like, that's obviously a problem from a Christian point of view. It's like, that's a world with no rights. The world with no competition left, and competition is what defends autonomy. That's what, you know, as crazy as it sounds, I think that that's the aim of central banking. I think they're, they've sort of, they're wrapping up imperialism, they're wrapping up expansion, and now they're shifting to consolidation. Hmm. Wow. So many things to think about with respect to how they seem to be changing the narrative a little bit so and like sort of prepping the next thing because and i think you're basically hinting at this is that with covid there were all sorts of little hints like that over the last 20 years that had we been paying attention we would have seen like you know all the scare around avian bird flu you know swine flu you know all, all these other things that were sort of like prep events for what eventually came, which was COVID. At a perfect and, time. Uh, exactly. Yeah. You, know, you know, they managed to kick the housing bubble down the road a decade, and now they can't stop it all from coming down. So now we get COVID. Hmm. Yeah. And, and I think what you're suggesting with all these other sort of stories is sort of like prepping us for another thing, like in another 10 years, or maybe this like just sort of like a bag of stuff that they have and they pull it out whenever they need to. So as uh, situations change, but yeah, maybe they throw a bunch at the wall and see what gets traction, right? They're testing things. And, and, you know, so that seems like, oh my gosh, how could any group have that much power? And it's like, if that was your sole focus and you were working on the order of decades through focus groups, through think tanks, like, okay, what's kind of good? Let's test out this and that. What's going to be the, the dramatization that we unleash on the world in order to do the risky business of reset in order to upgrade the state, right? I, and of course that has a Christian view. Of course that has a theological mm -hmm. view because when you have a small group of wealthy, powerful people trying to go to war with the uh, individual autonomy, with the, the nuclear family, with, you know, basically, you know, the current fiat system is, is veiled usury, right? It's usury, mm -hmm. but they've done their best to hide it. And they, they did a good job until we got into economic winter. Now it's on display. <laughs> it's it's mm -hmm. really on display. But mm -hmm. the CBDC, they're completely dropping the veil. It's just like you don't even own your money, right? The money expires. It returns to that group of central planners, right? They can program it. They can control when you spend it. So, you know, they're going for it, right? They're going for it right now. It's this opportune time. And 
Well, I got to say, despite this whole thesis, I feel great. I think, you know, they got a big problem in Bitcoin. I think they got a big problem in people being able to freely speak on the internet. We're just talking through this. And, you know, I preach to people to opt out. You know, there's a risk gradient. You can move down it physically and digitally, right? You don't have Mm. to be in the middle of New York City right now, right? Mm. You can be... You can be somewhere that's a little more expensive to reach you, right? Mm. You don't have to be using Apple uh, iPhone with them launching a COVID passport on your phone. You know, there's you could use like a Graphene or Calyx. They just script the Google bits. It's still Android. So, you know, there's so much you can do just to sort of say, hey, I'm going to move down the risk gradient by Bitcoin time because Bitcoin's going to gut this whole thing. And it, it's shaping up to be this kind of face-off between peak centralization and liberating freedom tech and you know funny enough i think they want the whole thing wrapped up in society relaunched by 2030 if you read the materials out of davos that's what they're aiming at so everything's 2030 if you start looking in that direction you'll see that year everywhere i actually think that that's when we'll get the super cycle then Mm -hmm. or on and i think bitcoin will actually slay this the evil of this centralization i think it will free people Hmm. Very interesting. And like when you see this super cycle, when you see sort of like what's coming and you see Bitcoin as sort of like this way of opting out, how do you think this opt out continues uh, like beyond Bitcoin, right? Like what do people actually do to, I don't know, resist movement passports or, you know, as you were hinting at earlier, like some sort of controlled internet or something like that? Yeah, well, so after World War II, you had a Nuremberg Code. People basically woke up from their spell. Like, you know, the world, Mm. you know, it was like the hangover after. They realized what had occurred on Earth, and they came together and said, no more of this. We're not going to allow that ever again. Well, that didn't last very long, but (laughs) they came together and put that intention out there. And I think we'll get another Nuremberg-type event where folks are held accountable. I think maybe that'll be led by Bitcoiners in, in the next era. It might be decades from now. But I think you'll essentially get a new Nuremberg international code that prevents social scoring governance in the West, that prevents the total loss of autonomy of the individual. And I think as nice as that will be, really the thing that will cement the individual will be Bitcoin. Like when you can not fund this, that's better than law. That's better than a proclamation. When you can say, hey, I'm going to stop letting my family's time and sacrifice fund the central planning that, it, you know, at its worst creates these type of atrocities and creates, you know, the specter of absolute slavery and genocide. Because what you're doing is you're saying, you know, you're tacitly funding compounding sin. Mm. And once you're aware of it, you have a moral obligation to stop, to mm. opt out. And, and you're saying, Laser, what's the shape of society in the Bitcoin era? I think it's probably something like, okay, when seniorage is destroyed, you'll still have a government, but I think the Bitcoin will create a, you know, you'll be forced to fund it explicitly, immediately. And that means that the actual tax rate will be realized. So you might you know, society will learn that the tax rate is like above 90%. And history shows that that doesn't last very long, usually get like a revolt or a revolution. The national discussion will go from one of moral sparring, which it is right now, because money grows on trees, to one of what can we afford, right? Mm. And we will negotiate down the state. So Bitcoin will create that feedback loop that shrinks the state. Then you have the sovereign individual thesis where brilliant capitalists will be attracted to leaner states, So overall, that should shrink the state. I think, you know, whether we end up with like a radical freedom of like an anarchy-like society or more of like a medieval HOA, you know, with this (laughs) tiny little government, I don't really care too much, right? If families can protect their time, you know, I think that solves all the problems these Malthusians think they're solving with population control, think they're solving with um, AI governance. Just you know, reversing inflation and going to a world on deflation, I think solves most of the problems that central planners are hysteric about. So, Mm. you know, I think that's a return to family. It's a return to individual. And I think you're going to see a huge resurgence of Christianity because of that. Mm. Well, I'm certainly praying for that. But 
All right. This conversation has sort of taken us in all sorts of different directions, especially with regard to this sort of global cabal of people that kind of want these things to continue. And at the core is kind of money. What do you think happens with this current crisis? Because I think that's the one that a lot of people are wondering about with respect to, you know, like, COVID and specifically, you know, there's like a new variant that they're talking about. I think we know sort of like a lot of the science and stuff like that. And, you know, the scaremongering that's going on. Like, is this like what they're going to keep doing until 2030? Or is there something else that they're planning? Or how do you think this resolves itself? Because I think that's a question that a lot of people have. Yep. So, you know, whether or not it's a cabal, which is suggests mm-hmm. that there's a dark, you know, explicit mission <laughs> on their part. I don't know. I mean, I think it's probably more likely that it's like a cronyist um, cartel, right? It's a group of families that preside over the most powerful industry on the planet and have done it on the order of centuries. And um, instead of competing, it's more profitable to collude. It's easier to collude. And I think all cronious industries, they all arc towards collusion. And so like a cartel forming. So I think that that's more likely because they don't have the constraint of honesty that something like a Bitcoin would force them to be honest um, or would eliminate their industry entirely. But so that's how I feel on that. You know, what's next? I think it depends how well the... Okay, so here we are heading into winter. We're in winter uh, 2021. And so Mm -hmm. we're two years into what I argue is World War III. It's an info war. It's a it's a fear war. It's the whole world against a virus, but really it's mm-hmm. the whole world against central planners. And I think a lot, and they've just launched Omicron, right? Oh no. Mm. But so far it's been kind of, I argue it's like a little bit of a false start, right? Like it's not nearly as deadly and COVID wasn't very deadly. So <laughs> this is far less deadly. It's like on the order of like a common cold and they're showing the symptoms and it, it looks like a, a NyQuil commercial. It's like, you know, fever, you know, runny nose, sore throat, you know, it's like, okay, that's what you got. And so like, I think a a lot depends on what happens with Omicron this winter. Like if it works and it it allows for the expansion of what you see in like Australia or New Zealand, because I think those are like the trident that's what's in front. Um, so, you know, they're, they're trailblazing to see how much they can get away with and, and they want to propagate that. And so like, if Omicron lets like these quarantine camps come to the U.S., I think a lot matters on that. So I, I think they'll ride out COVID as long as they can. If COVID dries up and another way, oh, they'll have to pivot. So if like the fear dies down is another way. So if you keep, you know, you keep your finger on the fear, if that gets too low, they have to pivot into something. Mm-hmm. And so whether they unleash a new designer virus, like a new form of smallpox, I, hard to say. I think they could go the way of uh, the cyber pandemic, which is, it's not, I don't think it's something like the internet's off for months or their power's off for months because the collateral damage is so high, there wouldn't be anything left if they did that. I think it's more likely that they have convinced the telcos and the banks like, okay, you're going to have this key part in the next monetary order. So you'll have, we're going to ensure continuity through this reset for your position. And what you need to do is collude with each other to shut the internet off for, like, honestly, What would be long enough that it didn't cause irreversible collateral damage and and pandemonium, but still long enough that you could create that 24-7 deafening hysteria loop of the last two years? And I've thought about this. The answer is probably like two days, (laughs) right? Like one day, like, you know, we've every year Amazon goes off for like a day. So like that's probably not enough. Um, Power Mm -hmm. is enough to scare the hell out of people. So it's probably some combination of like, one to two days of either internet banking and power or some combination of i could see them afterwards saying like okay that was a cyber attack maybe they blame it on russia or china then all the west joined together like nato they joined together against cyber terrorism i could see them declaring article 7 which they haven't done since 9/11 which basically means all the West is now in a war against whatever the thing they declared is. So, okay, now you have all the West, which is happens to be the countries going along with the Great Reset, suddenly in a cyber war <laughs> <laughs> against their own fear op. 
And then, of course, so then you get the 24-7 hysteria loop that we had from COVID. Now, you know, it would almost be like COVID was forgotten at that point. And now we're in a new chapter. And now people are being terrified about the banking system, terrified about the Internet. And they're engineering consent to, okay, the old way doesn't work anymore, right? We have to restore trust. You know, we're in a pickle because our whole world's online now. We're all remote everything. We're all, you know, we've changed the way we live. So this is everything. And that's when I, you know, I think you'll get the average people demanding government login, demanding internet passport. So internet pandemic, internet lockdowns, internet passports. Um, oh. <laughs> that's, that's what I <laughs> Sounds <think>. lovely. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the good news is, is that like, just like with real life, they can't control everything. You know, they can control like the cities pretty well. They can, you know, make a bunch of noise there. The internet's like that. The internet's it has centralization, but fundamentally, it's a decentralized technology. And if the one thing the internet does well is routing around censorship. So like, you know, okay, so Twitter and all these web social media has gone crazy to, to censor. Well, all that's done is created a resurgence in decentralized social networks. Like you have people in making these element matrix communities that it's like it's end to end encrypted. There's no point of failure. Like, good luck. They can congregate. You can't stop. Like, that's all it served to do, Right. Um, you know, they censor the money and they steal people's time through the money that served to create Bitcoin. So I think as much as they're trying, they're just creating the world they're trying to prevent, right? You're creating this sovereign era, this era of this individual as you're trying to fight gravity. Hmm. And I, I feel the same way about an internet passport, right? Like, they, you know, okay, I could see Google being like, okay, we're going to add that. You have to associate your Gmail with your digital ID. Okay, you need that now. And I could see Twitter doing it like, and maybe they're being forced by way of national security after this big, you know, 9-11 for the internet, you know, once they 9-11 the internet. So that's what I think we're in store for in the coming years. They're going to milk COVID as long as it's milkable. So as long as the fear can be kept up. And I don't know if that means through 2022 or maybe Omicron's a complete flop. And, you know, the biggest thing is they're in the middle of reset. You notice we haven't reset the balance sheet. We're not using CBDCs. So it's an area of high danger for the state. So they cannot afford to have the fear reduced. It needs to stay high, and it will stay high until they've finished uh, relaunching society. So that's why I think they're going to queue up whatever the hell they need to, to keep it going. And without nuclear as an option, like this psychological war is all they got. I mean, and that's why I wouldn't want to be them. They're in a sketchy place with Bitcoin rising right now. I mean, it, and with people sort of, they're scaring people into like, using cryptography and like privacy, you know, everyone's becoming privacy geeks. Like it's a bad place to be if you're a central planner right now. Mm. I'm sure that's been said at other times as well until, you know, they collapse or something like that. Anyway. All right. So I can't believe we've been going for an hour and a half already. <laughs> uh, so let's just sort of like try to wrap this up. There is this, I think what you've basically argued is that there's this large debt cycle of money and and after the state sort of takes a lot of your resources away through money printing, there comes a time to pay the piper. And what I think you've argued is basically that they have war or some sort of crisis in order to get you to not see what's actually going on under the hood. And after that sort of thing happens, you know, they reset again and, you know, they go into another cycle and so on. But in the meantime, you just sort of, you know, don't notice because of sort of that collective spell, perhaps a fear that we're sort of put into in order to for them to get away with it, basically. And yes. what you're suggesting, I think, is and, that and they believe they're saving the world. Yeah. Clearly. Yeah, which is kind of strange in a way. But I mean, th this is kind of what we're told every time, right? Like 2008 and, you know, this current one, 2001, you know, but you could keep going backwards. And this whole thing is a way for them to reset the death cycle, continue their grift, continue their control, and money is at the heart of it. And what ends up happening is that Bitcoin is this thing that they've never had to deal with before. Yeah. And it's, it seems like something that is hopefully good for humanity <laughs> in that it, it gets us out of this weird cycle of enslavement to the oligarchs. Would that be an accurate summation? 
Yeah, I think you nailed it. I mean, when you say they, you know, when we're talking, we're saying they, 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 it does sound mm-hmm. cabalish. And I, we have to be careful there in order to mm-hmm. remain cre- credible. I mean, the, the, the fact <laughs> is, is... I've thrown credibility out the window on this one. But yeah. <laughs> Listen, the, the fact is, the government exists. It presides over society in terms of rules. And the debt cycle is real as well. And they need a plan to manage that. In their mind, they want to deliver society through sovereign default. And so mm. and so they're in a corner with a lot of bad options. But in the blind spot, they don't see the option of let's move the world on a Bitcoin standard because that would mean giving up seniorage. And so mm-hmm. in their mind, the constraint is, and that's where the evil plays in, because it's not on the table to to eliminate the fiat experience, experiment, they must extend it into a new chapter. And so then they say, well, I don't have a choice. It's all these terrible options. Let's pick the, the least worst option. And we're doing it to help everyone because catastrophe and chaos and the end of the world would be the alternative. And so, yes, we're lying to them, but it's for their own good. Mm. All right. Well, on that happy note, where can people find you? Where can people contact you? So I'm on Twitter, you know, I've been following, tracking the Great Reset, and I'm a huge Bitcoin maximalist. And I think, you know, we're living through the most consequential 10 years of the next several thousand years. Laser hodl on Twitter. I think, you know, this thing doesn't need help imploding. Let me just put it that way. It's fascinating to watch. It's fascinating to view history through the lens of money instead of the lens of the historical events we've been told. And But at the end of the day, they can't defeat, you know, they're never going to defeat the human spirit. They're never going to defeat God. You know, the individual wins in the end. Bitcoin wins in the end. So if, if you're interested, pay attention. But in general, just move out of the blast radius. Focus on Bitcoin. Focus on your family. Things will be good. And just the best way to not participate is not to. Just opt out. And that's mm. the advice I give to families. You know, focus on the next era. There's so much opportunities to start reimagining your family line on a Bitcoin standard. The fiat era is really ending. This soft era really is ending. Now is the time for hard men to start, kind of build themselves up and leave that era behind. And, and there's, you know, we're so lucky to be in it. And so I know a lot of my message is like, oh, man, that's heavy. Um, but the reality is I'm white pilled. I'm, you know, I'm full of love and excitement about what we're going through. And I think it's, uh, birth is painful. You know what I mean? Birth is painful. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you for being on the show. Thanks, Jimmy. Unchained Capital is a sponsor of this podcast. I'm an advisor to the company. I know the team well, and I'm excited for what they are building. If you need multi-sig, collaborative custody, or a Bitcoin native financial services partner, learn more at Unchained. Well, that wraps it up for this episode of Bitcoin Fixes This. Laser Hodl can be found at at LaserHodl on Twitter. Until next time, fiat delenda est.